It's time for you all to wake up and shift your paradigm. This world is the kingdom of darkness and we are living in its last days. It won't be long before the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. The heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat and the earth and everything therein shall be burnt up. The Luciferian elite have been setting up the new world order and now they've established the globalist beast system for the rise of that wicked one and revealing of the man of sin who comes after the workings of Satan. Don't take my word for it. Read the Bible and you'll know that perilous times shall come in the last days. And we are in the last days. President Trump visited Jerusalem in 2017. Wearing a black yarmulke or skull cap, he slowly walked towards the Western Wall, one of the holiest sites in Judaism, and pressed his right hand flat against the stone in silent prayer. Also known as the Wailing Wall, it is the last remaining outer wall of the Temple Mount, the site of the first and second temple of Jerusalem. The first temple was built during the reign of King David's son, Solomon, completed around 957 BC and destroyed by the Babylonians in 587 BC. The second temple was started by Herod the Great in 20 BC and destroyed by the Romans in 70 AD, leaving only this support wall. Made of limestone, the wall comprises 45 rows of stone, 28 above ground, and 17 underground. But what is the significance for President Trump's visit and what shaped his staunch support of Israel, considered by many to be among the most pro-Zionist presidents in U.S. history? Considered the Holy Land for Muslims, Christians, and Jews, Palestine, or modern Israel, was once home to the Phoenicians, a people whose name comes from the Greek word for red, as they did not refer to themselves as such, but rather are thought to have referred to themselves as Kenaani, meaning Canaanites. According to the book of Genesis, Canaan was a grandson of Noah, and the term Canaan appears throughout the Bible as a geography associated with the Promised Land in the eastern Mediterranean part of the Levant. Egyptian records tell us that several of the Sea Peoples settled in Canaan. One of them were the Philistines, who, in the 12th century BC, invaded and settled on the coast of what is now known as Gaza. The Egyptians called them Peliset, which incidentally is where we get the term Palestine, as used by the world's first known historian Herodotus in the 5th century BC. The biblical Goliath, the giant slain by David, for example, was a Philistine. Delilah was another biblical Philistine, sent to cut the hair of the Israelite leader Samson, thus stripping him of his power. But who were the Philistines exactly? Scientists sequence genomes from people thought to be Philistines that lived on the Mediterranean coast of Israel between the 12th and 8th century BC. The results, which were published in the journal Science Advances, suggest the Philistines shared genetic affinities with people from southern Europe, seen in Iron Age populations from Greece, Spain, and Sardinia. Incidentally, it's thought that the island country off the coast of Italy, Sardinia, was named by seafaring Danites, or the tribe of Dan, the second largest of the twelve tribes of Israel, after Judah, which Samson was said to have belonged to. Its history was largely lost after the northern kingdom of Israel was conquered by the Assyrians in 722 BC. However, a number of scholars note that the arrival of the Tuta de Danans in Ireland is recorded in the early histories of that land. 
as a maritime tribe, it would have been easy for many Danites to escape the advancing Assyrians by sailing west, and ancient Irish records indicate that the tribe of Dan arrived in Ireland at about the time of the fall of Samaria, or northern Israel. While a sizable contingent of Israelites from the tribes of Dan and others fled by sea to Iberia and the British Isles, those tribes actually taken captive by Assyria later migrated over hundreds of years into northern Europe, which incidentally is named after Europa, a Phoenician princess from Tyre, a small island off the coast of modern Lebanon. So we're well aware of northern Europe, where waves of Scythians settled in antiquity were also thought to be comprised of lost tribes, also mentioned in Irish annals and recently verified by genetic sequencing. Archaeologist Thor Heyerdahl also did research into the origins of the Scandinavians, concluding that the Swedish royal dynasty and Norse kings descended from a mass migration from the Scythian territory of the Russian steppes by the northern ridge of the Caucasus Mountains. Led by Odin, who before being deified was based on the flesh and blood chief that led his people north through Germany into Scandinavia prior to being converted to Christianity. The idea that Scythian tribes comprised the nobility and royal families of Europe, most of whom used the Lion of Judah as a coat of arms, is mirrored by numerous rabbis. The people collectively known as Israelites were dispersed or deported from the Middle East after the conquest by the Assyrian Empire around 720 BC. The Jewish historian Josephus wrote that, quote, The ten tribes are beyond the Euphrates till now and are an immense multitude and not to be estimated in numbers. Some of the names of these tribes became known as the Camerians, Scythians or Scythians, Goths, Celts, Anglo-Saxons, and Vikings. These days, many of their descendants have been converted to Christianity, so no longer retain any connection to their ancient ancestry. One such tribe is that of Dan, whose migration left their name in parts of Europe, such as the Danube River, or the nation of Denmark, as can be seen on the 17th century Dutch map. Remnants of these people can also be identified in Scotland and Ireland, with some tribes becoming the Amish in America and others settling South Africa, establishing agricultural civilization there 500 years ago, but today have lost their land and identity to Afrocentric communism and face total genocide. Scandinavian people in general being amongst the most lactose-tolerant people on earth, meaning they can digest milk as adults, a genetic trait that stems from Aryans of Eurasia who domesticated cattle and disseminated them into Europe during the Holocene, along with blue eyes. Northern Europeans also have a relatively high degree of rhesus-negative blood type. According to Herodotus, the Neuri were a tribe living beyond the Scythian, roughly the area of modern northern Ukraine and southern Belarus also said to be the ancestors of the Slavic people. In the 18th century, the Swedish historian Olaf von Dalen believed that the ancient Finns, alongside Laps and Estonians, who sprung from the Nuri, ultimately descended from the lost tribes of Israel. Quote, the Nuri seem to have been remnants of the ten tribes of Israel, which the king of Assyria brought as captives out of Canaan. When one realizes that the language of these ancient Finns, Laps, and Estonians is similar to the Hebrew, and even that this people in ancient times reckoned their years beginning from the 1st of March and Saturday as their Sabbath, then one sees that the Nuri in all probability had this origin. Finland is most commonly identified with the tribe of Issachar. Incidentally, the Finnish word for father is Issa. Which brings us to the Germans, who are closely related genetically to Britons, Dutch, and Scandinavians, while the Middle Eastern or Eurasian origins of certain Nordic and Germanic tribes is documented in the 12th century by the Icelandic historian Snorri Sturluson in the Chronicles of the Kings of Norway. Sturluson 
wrote that they, under the leadership of a priest chief Odin, had trekked from regions south of the Caucasus Mountains called Turkland via Russia to Northern Europe. Quote, on the south side of the mountains, which lie outside of all inhabited lands, runs a river through Swithold, which is properly named by the name of Tanais, but was formerly called Tanaquissel or Vaniquissel, and which falls into the Black Sea. The country of the people on Vaniquissel was called Vanaland or Vanaheim, and the river separates the three parts of the world, of which the easternmost part is called Asia and the westernmost Europe. Swithoid was the Scandinavian name for Scythia, which covered a vast area including all of southern Russia, most of Ukraine, and most of Central Asia. Tanais was the ancient name for the river Don. Sturluson continues, quote, There goes a great mountain barrier from the northeast to southwest, which divides the great Swithoid from other kingdoms. South of this mountain ridge, it is not far to Turkland, where Odin had great possessions. In those times, the Roman chiefs went wide around in the world, subduing to themselves all people, and on this account many chiefs fled from their domains. But Odin, having foreknowledge and magic sight, knew that his posterity would come to settle and dwell in the northern half of the world. He therefore set his brothers V and Vilj over Asgard, and he himself, with all the gods and a great many other people, wandered out, first westward to Garterlake, and then south to Saxland. He had many sons, and after having subdued an extensive kingdom in Saxland, he set his sons to rule the country. He himself went northward to the sea, and took up his abode in an island which is called Odin's Island in Finn. Saxland is Saxony. The mentioned sea is the Baltic Sea. The largest city on Finn, the third largest Danish island, is Odense, a name which means Odin's island. The Danish historian Peter Friedrich Schum wrote, speaking of Scandinavians, that, quote, the ancestors of ourselves, the Germans, and the Celts, lived together in Asia Minor. Snorri Sturluson and Peter Friedrich Schum did trace the ancestors of the Nordic and Germanic tribes back to the Caucasus regions and Turkey, but they did not trace them further than that. They did not trace them all the way back to the lost tribes of Israel, but in 1723, the French Huguenot Dune Jacques Abedi, who lived in exile in Germany, the Netherlands, and Britain, did so in the book La Triomphe de la Providence et de la Religion. Quote, Unless the ten tribes of Israel are flown into the air or sunk into the earth, they must be the ten Gothic tribes that entered Europe in the 5th century, overthrew the Roman Empire, and then founded the ten nations of modern Europe. Four of those Germanic tribes, the Eastern Franks, the Bavarians, Swabians, and Saxons, evolved into Germany after the division of Charlemagne's Frankish Empire in the 9th century. The origins of the modern state of Germany began with the Frankish Empire. The Franks were a large Germanic tribe that lived around the Lower Rhine in what today is West Middle Germany, parts of the Netherlands, Belgium, Luxembourg, and Northern France. They defeated the Roman governor who ruled Northern France in 507, defeated the Visigoths, and annexed Southwest Gaul. Charlemagne expanded the kingdom of the Franks, and on Christmas 800 AD in Rome, Charlemagne was crowned emperor of the Frankish Empire by Pope Leo III. Charlemagne's son, Louis the Pious, inherited the empire, but after his death and a brief civil war, his three sons divided the empire into three parts. Early in the 10th century, the kingdom of Germany was made up of tribal duchies of the larger Germanic tribes. Between the 10th and 13th century, the German tribal duchies dissolved into regions ruled by families or nobility. That said, I'd like to reiterate some information that I covered in a previous video about the Templar Society, a German Protestant sect with roots in the Pietist movement of the Lutheran Church. They spell Templar differently than the Knights Templar, 
but their beliefs also revolve around rebuilding the temple in Jerusalem, the land reclaimed by the Knights Templar during the Crusades, the part of the Levant once considered part of the Phoenician Empire, and where the Egyptian historian Manetho claimed that the Hyksos pharaohs settled by those that the Bible calls Israelite. For now, I'd like to point out some interesting facts about President Trump, whose paternal ancestry is traceable to Bohemian Amberg, a village in southwestern Germany in the 18th century. Its residents are known as Palatines. Their historic coat of arm is the Palatine Lion, with its tongue extended, a red crown, symbols of their ruling families as seals, and also on the Bavarian coat of arms. Bavaria's origins date back to Celts and Subian groups. The Celts identify as one of the lost tribes that entered Europe, and the Subians should sound familiar to my readers as in Swabia, or Neuschwabenland, the area of Antarctica annexed by the nationalist Germans and central to Operation High Jump, the classified post-World War II military invasion of Antarctica by Allied forces. Johann Trump, born in Bogenheim in 1789, moved to the nearby village of Kalstadt, where his grandson, Frederick Trump, the grandfather of Donald Trump, was born in 1869. This German heritage was long concealed by Donald Trump's father, Fred Trump, after World War II and until the 1980s. He told people he was of Swedish ancestry. Donald Trump repeated this version in The Art of the Deal, published in 1987, but later said he was proud of his German heritage. You know, I'm proud to have that German blood. There's no question about it. Great stuff. Of course, Sweden was founded by the same group of people that we call Swabians, and very few people understand what that means. That said, one needs only look at the occult, meaning hidden, symbology of the Trump Tower to gain a deeper insight into his true ancestry. Completed in 1983, it has an official height of 664 feet, but if you count its spire, however, it raises its height to 666 feet. While 666 is called the number of the beast in most manuscripts of Revelation, a fragment of the earliest papyrus gives a number of 616 as the original number of the beast. In a Kabbalistic context, 666 is a positive, holy number associated with light, or the sun, and the heart chakra. 666 is also the number of the goddess, such as Ishtar, Isis, Aphrodite, and is sacred in Egyptian mythology. It's related to sex, fertility, and motherhood. That said, Trump Tower also features an inverted triangle made up of trees or bushes. An upside down triangle is also a symbol of the goddess. In alchemy, it means water or the divine feminine energy. And if you look closely, you'll see that the trees are arranged in three rows of six, making up the three sides of the triangle. I'd like to also point out that the tree itself is a sacred sex symbol from the tree in the Garden of Eden, to the fig or bodhi tree associated with Buddha and enlightenment, which is really a reference to Tantra. Above this inverted triangle of trees, we see seven pillars rising. If you count the points at the top of the building, you'll notice there are seven, which in Tantra are the number of chakras in the human body. In astrotheology, there are seven gods, meaning the five visible planets with the naked eye, plus the sun and the moon. In Islam, or Sufi cosmology, there are seven heavens and hells. And, of course, in the biblical context, it's the seven days of creation. In a more esoteric perspective, seven has to do with sacred geometry. As Pythagoras tells us, the number seven is, quote, the essence or first principle of things. The famous G in the square and compass symbol is publicly regarded as standing for God or the generative principle, but in esoteric context, it stands for the seventh letter of the alphabet. 
which alludes to the ancient esoteric tantric practices or semen retention coupled with arousal and internal alchemy results in what is regarded as a kundalini awakening or heightened pineal awareness. That said, here's the same concept reiterated by ex-Freemason Bill Schnobellen. And here's the great mystery of masonry, the great mystery of all these ancient mystery religions. And I'm going to try and be as delicate as I can about this, folks, but it's kind of gross. This is what these people worship. Believe it or not, the mystery that none of these people could solve, that none of these people, these ancient sages, could understand is the fact that the male organ, when it brings forth seed, it dies and can't be resurrected for a while, whereas the female organ is immortal or eternal. That is what this whole thing is about. This whole thing is a giant solar phallic cult. That said, Donald Trump is of RH negative blood type. A self-proclaimed Christian, he's also an initiate that, like the Freemasons and Rosicrucians, subscribe to a lineage based on the heritage of the Knights Templar, who claim descent from High Temple priests of Jerusalem, whose ancestors fled into Europe after the destruction of the Temple, and introduced Kabbalah into European secret societies, which for a time was regarded as alchemy. This ancient Aryan bloodline goes back to the Magi of Mesopotamia and priests of ancient Egypt, who according to German textbooks up until 1945 were regarded as the true origins of the Nordic people. During the Holocene, as indicated by the yellow circles on this map, who eventually migrated north into Europe and Scandinavia. This should also help to explain why Trump uses the lion symbol, as I've already explained about his ancestry, Germanic bloodline, and occult significance he incorporates into his architecture, as well as his personal allegiance to an ancient Kabbalistic network that is misunderstood by many and completely unknown to most. It goes back to Babylon in the 6th century BC, uh, the development of a uh, tradition that merged the worship of underworld gods with Babylon history, have Babylon history of magic and astrology. And uh, so this is basically what came to be, uh, in, in the Jewish tradition, came to be uh, known as Kabbalah. Basically, it's it's a hierarchy of Judaism, and so it's you know they the early practitioners would present themselves to the world as merely being an interpretation of Judaism, and basically as a way of disguising their apostasy from Judaism. And what it's based on is the idea that Solomon uh, had learned magic somehow from uh, you know, basically some kind of discarded entities, demonic entities of some sort, and that he used that power to build, first of all, that he had um, a sigil or, you know, the, um, the the star of David or the star of, the, sorry, the star of Solomon, it was a six-point star, which he used as a seal to con on a ring, apparently, to control these demons. And then he used his control over these demons to build the temple the temple of solomon so there is a legitimate orthodox tradition in judaism that looks forward to the rebuilding of the temple as you know part of the fulfillment of bible prophecy uh, with the return of the messiah and there's a parallel satanic tradition a cult kabbalistic tradition that uh, also aspires to rebuilding of the of the third temple but uh, their messiah is the uh, is the antichrist. So that's why when uh, you look at a group like the Knights Templar, for example, who are, which is really where modern Western occultism begins, they are founded again on the idea of this reconstruction of the temple. Their place in history was appropriated by the Freemasons, who continued this concept of. Uh, of rebuilding of the temple. So they're called masons or bricklayers because supposedly they are laying the bricks uh, for the foundations of effectively a new world order, which is to be governed by the expected Messiah. As I said, this is 
understood to them to be a fulfillment of Bible prophecy. Uh, there's a, you know, the, the, the rebuilding of the temple is, you know, central to um, uh, Jewish expectation, but it's also found, of course, in the book of Revelation, which turns out to be effectively used uh, as a template uh, for them to follow. And this is according to Albert Pike, who is, was the, who wrote Morals and Dogma. He, first of all, he's the Grand Master of uh, Scottish Rite for Masonry, wrote the Morals and Dogma, which served very much as a, as a kind of Bible uh, for Masonry. It outlines the plan that they are to follow. So they want to actively work towards fulfilling Bible, Bible, fulfilling Bible prophecy, which is why they are, uh, you know, by analogy, reconstructing the Third Temple. But again, what they're doing is rebuilding the Third Temple. When you look at the, especially right up until modern times, you look at the history of the Kabbalah, it's based on the belief that the the the, the sons of God, uh, the, the Anunnaki, the Anakim, uh, were offspring of the sons of God and human beings, and so that this this uh, the superior race, they're they're called in the Zohar, they're called in fact in the Bible they're called the mixed multitude, and it's the Zohar that associates them with the the sons of God, and so the this mixed multitude is the Aryan race. So as, as paradoxical as it might seem, the whole concept of the Aryan race is actually a Kabbalistic uh, myth of Jewish, you know, occult Jewish supremacy. And so uh, it's the belief that they are are semi-divine because they are uh, offspring of fallen angels. And on the on the Christian side, these would be the I.E. sons of God, the descendants of these I.E. spirits and humans, right? Yeah, and okay. more than that, it's basically the fundamental Kabbalistic belief is that the sons of God uh, created a race of, uh, of beings that, sorry, a race of superior humans who have been preserving the ancient wisdom ever since. Oliver Pike uh, mm -hmm. was a proponent of the of, of Aryan theories. He later became a member of the Theosophical Society, which, of course, was headed by Blavatsky, who was the most recent proponent or, you know, elaborator of the of the Aryan myth, the mythology that the Aryans are uh, survivors of Atlantis, who are originally descendants of the sons of God, Anakim Anunnaki, who had preserved the ancient wisdom, quote unquote, Kabbalah uh, since that time. Lost tribes uh, who are, you know, among the Scythians that are considered really the, the descendants or the Aryans, the source of the Aryan people. So you have the simultaneous history, which is weird. Why basically you've got, you know, it's it's a it's a Jewish esoteric mythology which produced the Aryan race, while also, uh, yeah, that produced the Aryan race. So you have this dual path of you know this like legitimate uh, Jewish descent simultaneously this competing, uh, opposing uh, Aryan descent, but they seem to uh, feed the like mythology brothers or cousins right and then they're both masters of the horse you know and they they literally conquered the world on the horse which brings us to the ancestry of modern jewish populations based on dna sequencing of which the largest demographic are ashkenazi who make up roughly 80 percent of the world's jews including 90 percent of those in america we know that the first ashkenazi communities emerged in the rhineland at the height of the middle ages around the 10th century but how and when Jews first reached the Rhine Valley is now being uncovered through genetic sequencing. A detailed look at thousands of genomes finds that their DNA likely came from Italy. Quote, The result was very clear cut, the authors say. As reported in Nature Communications, more than 80% of Ashkenazi mtDNA had their origins thousands of years ago in Western Europe, during or before biblical times, and in some cases, even before farming came to that part of the continent some 7,500 years ago. The closest matches were the mtDNAs from people who today live in and around Italy. The data are very convincing, says Antonio Toroni, a geneticist at the University of Pavia in Italy and a leading expert in the genetics of Europeans. He adds that recent studies of DNA from the cell nucleus have also shown, quote, a very close similarity between Ashkenazi Jews and Italians. The close genetic resemblance to Italians accords with the historical presumption that Ashkenazi Jews started their migrations across Europe in Italy, and with historical evidence that conversion to Judaism was common in ancient Rome. 
These genetic findings linking Ashkenazi Jews with conversions to Judaism in ancient Rome are interesting for a number of reasons. They explain certain phenotype characteristics of some European Jews, such as why many European Jews have brown eyes and dark hair, given that the demographics associated with the Israelite lost tribes in Europe seem to be comprised of fair-haired and light-eyed Germanic types. Also, the stereotypical Roman nose with a prominent bridge, which was revered in ancient Rome and referred to as aquiline, which comes from the Latin word aquilinus, meaning eagle-like, because it appears bent like an eagle, which at the time was characterized as a marker of beauty and nobility. That said, in ancient Rome, when a slave was freed, his head was shaved and a pileus was placed on it, which was a small felt skull cap considered a symbol of libertas, the goddess representing liberty. One 19th century dictionary of classical antiquity states that, quote, among the Romans, the cap of felt was the emblem of liberty. When a slave obtained his freedom, he had his head shaved and wore, instead of his hair, an undyed pileus. A celebrated hero for many liberal political leftist Jews is Spartacus, a gladiator that led a rebel slave army against Rome, who was said to have freed up to 100,000 slaves, including many of whom were presumably Jewish. In fact, one of the founders of the organization known as the Illuminati, Adam Weishaupt, adopted the code name of Brother Spartacus within the order. Karl Marx, Joseph Stalin, and Vladimir Lenin all praised Spartacus as he was a major figure in communist Soviet ideology. And while most people are familiar with and can relate to the story of the underdog that stood up to power, there are some covert elements to the story that are much less known. That said, one in three people in the Roman Republic were slaves. Which brings us back to Spartacus, a slave who was trained to be a gladiator and plotted his escape around 73 BC. About 70 other slaves were part of the plot. Though few in number, they seized kitchen utensils, fought their way free from the fight school, and seized several wagons of gladiatorial weapons and armor. The escaped slaves defeated soldiers sent after them, plundered the surrounding region, recruited many other slaves into their ranks, and eventually retired to a defensible position on Mount Vesuvius. Spartacus and his slave army defeated several attempts by the Romans to police the matter, and grew their ranks to some 70,000 strong. After several major battles, Spartacus's rebel forces were eventually crushed, with Plutarch, Apion, and Florus all claiming that Spartacus died during the battle, but his body was never actually found. In modern times, Spartacus became an icon for communists and socialists. Karl Marx listed Spartacus as one of his heroes and described him as, quote, the most splendid fellow in the whole of ancient history, as Spartacus remained a great inspiration to left-wing revolutionaries throughout history. In ancient Rome, a slave was freed in a ceremony where the slave's head was shaved and a Peleus was placed on it. The Peleus was a brimless felt cap and among the Romans was an emblem of liberty, traditionally made of white undyed wool. Many of these freed men would organize themselves into secret groups with the shared goal of overturning existing power structures to bring about an egalitarian utopia, much in the same way that Spartacus would share looted spoils with his slave army equally. One of the reasons he was so popular and experienced such rapid growth and expansion. Following the assassination of Julius Caesar in 44 BC, Brutus and his co-conspirators instrumentalized this symbol of the Peleus to signify the end of Caesar's dictatorship. These Roman associations of the Peleus with freedom from rulers seen as suppressive or too powerful was carried forward to the 18th century when the Peleus was confused with the Phrygian cap, then becoming a symbol of those values. For example, it became the symbol of the Masonic French Revolution after the Masons were infiltrated by Weisop's Illuminati. After the overthrow of the French monarchy, the French Declaration of Human Rights was said to be officially recorded as the Masonic values of the new French government, whose new motto was freedom, equality, and brotherhood. The official document of the Declaration of Human Rights is guarded by Masonic pillars and contains several occult symbols such as the all-seeing eye of God and the red Phrygian cap, 
a symbol of free men or Freemasons. So with genetic research indicating that Ashkenazi Jews started their migrations across Europe in Italy, and with historical evidence that conversion to Judaism was common in ancient Rome, in particular around the time of Spartacus, then the political divide amongst the descendants of the Jewish demographic starts to make sense. President Trump visited Jerusalem in 2017. Wearing a black yarmulke or skull cap, he slowly walked towards the Western Wall, one of the holiest sites in Judaism, and pressed his right hand flat against a stone in silent prayer. Also known as the Wailing Wall, it is the last remaining outer wall of the Temple Mount, the site of the first and second temple of Jerusalem. Nine out of ten Zionists are not Jewish. But what is Zionism? When did it start and what does it mean? The first settlements in Palestine in the early 1800s were not set up by Jews. The German Templars were part of the Christian Zionism movement whereby the European powers sought to establish their presence in the Holy Land after 1840. These adherents of the German Lutheran Church established settlements in Jerusalem, Haifa, Galilee, and what is now Tel Aviv, serving as a model for the Jewish pioneers who came much later, after the German Templars already established colonies, roads, infrastructure, and agriculture in the Holy Land. In the 1930s, many of the Templars in Palestine named after the Temple of Solomon, joined the Nazi party, and despite modern propaganda, their influence was acknowledged at the time, as was Hitler's role in working with Jewish Zionists to populate what became modern Israel. Quote, Jews from Germany have reinforced the economic growth they found in progress. Some of the earlier arrivals brought considerable means their investments have given a powerful impetus to the industries of the new Palestine. Boys and girls of urban families prepared themselves for the land, joining or founding colonies. Hitler made Haifa, runs a Jewish proverb. German Jews are helping to develop there a great industrial center for the Near East. Hitler didn't want to exterminate the Jews at the time, he wanted to expel the Jews. Nothing exists uh, showing that Hitler uh, ordered the extermination. There's no Hitler letter, uh, which is a smoking gun. N. Treffernung, the complete removal or the deliberate removal of the Jews. While the German National Socialist government had a working relationship with a sect of Zionist Jews, they were simultaneously hostile to a primarily secular Jewish movement which has some post-World War II historians confused, especially those that perceived the Jewish people as a homogenous, politically monolithic demographic, which they are not. In a 1920 article written by Prime Minister Winston Churchill titled Zionism versus Bolshevism, a struggle for the soul of the Jewish people, Churchill starts off by praising the Jewish people's contribution to Western civilization. He then goes on to describe what he calls international Jews as having, quote, Most, if not all, of them have forsaken the faith of their forefathers and divorced from their mind all spiritual hopes of the next world. This movement amongst the Jews is not new. From the days of Spartacus Weishaupt to those of Karl Marx and down to Trotsky, Bela Kuhn, Rosa Luxemburg, and Emma Goldman, this worldwide conspiracy for the overthrow of civilization and for the reconstitution of society on the basis of arrested development, of envious malevolence, and impossible equality has been steadily growing. It played a definitely recognizable part in the tragedy of the French Revolution. It has been the mainspring of every subversive movement during the 19th century 
And now, at last, this band of extraordinary personalities from the underworld of the great cities of Europe and America have gripped the Russian people by the hair of their heads and have become practically an undisputed masters of the enormous empire. There is no need to exaggerate the part played in the creation of Bolshevism and in the actual bringing about of the Russian Revolution by these international and for the most part atheistical Jews. It is certainly a very great one. It probably outweighs all others. With the notable exception of Lenin, the majority of the leading figures are Jews. Moreover, the principal inspiration and driving power comes from the Jewish leaders. In violent contrast to international communism, Zionism presents to the Jew a national idea of commanding character. It has fallen to the British government as a result of the conquest of Palestine to have the opportunity and responsibility of securing for the Jewish race all over the world a home and center of national life. Zionism has already become a factor in political convulsions of Russia as a powerful competing influence in Bolshevik circles with the international communistic system. Nothing could be more significant than the fury with which Trotsky has attacked the Zionists. The cruel penetration of his mind leaves him in no doubt that his schemes of a worldwide communistic state under the Jewish domination are directly thwarted and hindered by this new ideal, which directs the energies and the hopes of Jews in every land towards a simpler, a truer, and a far more attainable goal. The struggle which is now beginning between the Zionists and Bolshevik Jews is little less than a struggle for the soul of the Jewish people. It is particularly important in these circumstances that the national Jews in every country who are loyal to the land of their adoption should come forward on every occasion, as many of them in England have already done, and take a prominent part in every measure for combating the Bolshevik conspiracy. In this way, they will be able to vindicate the honor of the Jewish name and make it clear to all the world that the Bolshevik movement is not a Jewish movement, but is repudiated vehemently by the great mass of the Jewish people. In light of Churchill's acknowledgement of a secular left-wing conspiracy to impose a communist world order, and given that the Bolshevik revolution that ushered in the Soviet communism that killed tens of millions was a viable threat to all of Europe, Propaganda leaflets disseminated by Germany during World War II can be better understood in hindsight. Quote, you have been trapped. You have landed on the continent to face the armed might of Germany, but not for the benefit of Britain. Your country will gain absolutely nothing from this struggle, no matter how well you may fight. The Bolshevists alone will profit by your sacrifices. You have been trapped into risking your life for but one purpose, the Bolshevization of Europe. Consider these points and ask yourself, why should you fight for Stalin? Why die for Stalin? In dying for Stalin, your soldiers are not dying for democracy or the preservation of the democratic form of government. They're dying for the establishment of communism and a form of Stalinist tyranny throughout the world. Furthermore, they are not dying for the preservation of the integrity of a small nation, England's old war cry, but are dying so that Poland shall be a Soviet state, so that the Baltic states shall be incorporated into the Soviet Union, and so that Soviet influence shall extend from the Baltic to the Balkans. Every British soldier who lays down his life in this war is not only a loss to his own country, he is a loss to the common cause of European civilization. Germany and England's quarrel is a form of traditional rivalry. It is more in the nature of a private quarrel which Germany did not seek. The Soviet Union's quarrel, however, is a quarrel with the world. It is a quarrel with our common heritage and with all those values, moral, spiritual, cultural, and material, which we have, all of us, Englishmen and Germans. Why did Hitler really hate the Jews? What did he want from them? How did they bother him? But it's all written here in Mein Kampf. This book was published only recently. 
It just got approved to be translated to Hebrew. It was forbidden all these years. But there is an earlier translation. It was made by Yad Vashem. They were allowed to. Hitler claims in his book that the Jews are communists. They made the Russian Revolution. They killed their 30 million Russians, all the intelligent ones, in a cruel and horrific way. And that's their plan for the entire world. The next country in line is Germany. They founded the German communist and socialist parties, and it's true. If we don't defeat them now, they will eliminate us, and they will slaughter another 20 million, all the intelligent people. And that's how they want, from country to country. So eventually, the only intelligent ones remaining would be the Jews. And he repeats it many times. Make no mistake. And he is right. The Russian Revolution was made by the Jews. The Russian army was built by Trotsky, who was an incredible genius and anti-Semite like no other. He created the Jewish division of the Communist Party, which members informed on their father, mother, brother, and son. Whoever owns a Siddur, or even a Hebrew learning book, I'm not even talking about Teflon or Mikvah, he destroyed everything also by the Jews, but for sure by the Russians. In the first picture of the Russian government, out of 13 members, six were Jews. Who founded the KGB? Jews. So everything is clearly written. He didn't hate the Jews because they had peels. He didn't hate them for observing mitzvot. Because they are communists. And he writes it clearly. The Jews destroyed religion and faith. They spread in Germany the heresy in God because they don't believe in him. He writes this right here. Now you understand why they don't teach it in schools? Because who writes the curriculum? Those same leftists. They destroyed all the values, poisoned literature and theater. Who did it? Torah observant Jews poisoned the German theater? Out of nine large German newspapers, seven were owned by Jews. So do you understand why it's forbidden here to teach about him and what he says?